Okay, well, it is uh, 10 o'clock, and I'd like to welcome you to Gardening on the Gulf Coast. Uh, today, we will be covering beneficial insects in the landscape. Uh, just a few uh, items, um, you know, make sure your, your mics are off, uh, your, your video cameras are off. It will help with the streaming. Uh, there will be a, a short video uh, towards the end, which will make... Uh, uh, that streaming a lot easier. Uh, we do have several question wranglers uh, on today. So uh, we've got Boone from uh, Fort Bend County, Kevin down in Noasis, uh, Robert, uh, Skip over in Brazos, and Stephen in Brazoria. So uh, if you do have any questions, please just post them in the chat box uh, and then they will either be able to answer them or um, they will pose them to me later on. Um, just a reminder, uh, later on this month, next week, we will have Understanding Soils on the Texas Gulf Coast with uh, our specialist, Stephen Yannick. And then the end of the month, uh, Gingers for Tropical Flare with our own Mr. Stephen Brugerhoff, uh, who's our uh, horticulture agent in Brazoria County. So I'm Paul Winsky. I am the horticulture agent here in Harris County. And uh, let's get started. So today... We are going to talk about beneficial insects in the landscape, okay? Um, if you plant them, they will come. And the main thing I want to stress here is diversity in the landscape. Uh, we need pollen sources. We need nectar sources in order to keep those beneficials uh, happy. Uh, they are predators, so they are looking for insects uh, that they feed on. But... If that population is low, which would be a good thing for you in your garden, um, you still want to keep them around. So if you're strictly a vegetable grower, um, have some combination planters, have some annuals or, or some perennials somewhere. Uh, and then if you are into the ornamentals, you know, the good thing about gardening down here is we can have color and we can have uh, sources of pollen and nectar throughout the growing season. So we can keep them, uh, those beneficials, happy throughout the season. Um, so why we want to attract these? Uh, of course, these good bugs, um, they're going to feed on the pests that cause us problems. And, and that's what we want. Uh, but there's always a balance. There's always a threshold. Uh, if your pest population gets out of whack and, it, and it's too aggressive, um, you know, the, these, these good guys may not be able to keep up with them as quickly. Uh, so we want to do everything to, to draw them in and keep them uh, in our landscape. There's two major groups for these good guys or for the beneficials. We have predators, which will kill, and then they will feed on that prey. And then we have parasitoids, and these are going to be small, tiny wasps that will either deposit their eggs on or underneath or near their host. These eggs will develop, and as they're developing, they're actually feeding on a certain stage of the prey. Um, so we've got two of these general areas. And like all insects, all right, life cycles are dependent on temperature. So as our temperatures go up, the life cycles shorten. Uh, as we get cooler, those life cycles take longer because of uh, how the temperature influences uh, their overall body and the uh, uh, reproductive system. So um, we want these plants in there because just like you and I, we need, they need carbohydrates and protein. So if we've got the flowers in our landscape, um, the nectar provides carbohydrates and the pollen provides protein. Uh, so these are key, especially when your pest population is low. Um, we want to be able to keep them well fed and happy so they'll stay in our garden. So as uh, if any pests start to make their way in, they'll be available to feed on them. Um, these plants, these additional plants also, their foliage provides protection, you know, not only from the heat and the rain, but uh, also from other insects, okay? Uh, sometimes the hunters can be hunted. Uh, you know, we've got that full uh, circle of life going on out there. So protection from the heat and rain, a lot of times we'll find them on the underside of the foliage, uh, and then protection from the other insects. So this is the key why we want to have that diversity of uh, plant material in the landscape. 
Um, when we talk about an integrated approach, we're really taking all the tools in that toolbox that we can use in order to keep the pest population at a sustainable or, or at a manageable, um, what we call threshold. Um, you know, you, you can live with some, uh, but you don't want get you don't want populations getting out of whack that uh, we're seeing uh, damage to overall growth. Um, the aesthetics of the plant doesn't look good. So, in order to uh, incorporate this approach, uh, we always recommend scouting or monitoring your garden. All right. With greenhouse and nursery growers, they have groups, they have teams that go out in certain sections and they'll monitor. You want to do the same thing in your garden. You want to get to know not only the good bugs, but the bad bugs. And how can you do that? A magnifier is uh, essential, especially for some of the smaller ones. If you're looking for mites and things like that, or some of the uh, egg stages and things, you may not always be able to see them with the naked eye. Um, Skip talked about, you can see up here, uh, this loop. Uh, he uses it and puts it uh, onto his camera uh, in order to improve the, uh, the overall magnification. Um, these jeweler loops are great. Um, you can, if, if you're looking at something on a leaf, um, and the, the key to you having this work properly is you hold that loop to your eye and you move or you bring the, um, say the leaf with the insect towards it, uh, either in or out, and that's how you focus it. You don't move the loop, keep the loop near your eye and move the loop, the leaf uh, with the insect either closer or further away till it comes in into uh, a clear view. Um, when you're out in the garden, don't always walk the garden the same way. Um, go out different times of the day because these insects uh, are out at various times. Um, so the, the the more time you spend out there, um, and I know the heat of the day isn't the isn't the greatest, but even if it's just a short walk or just a a, a small section that you're you're looking at, uh, you'll be surprised at what you see and what you can learn. Um, we want to attract the beneficials that are all, already present. There's plenty of beneficial insects that are in the area. Um, we just want to provide them uh, an environment where they're going to be happy and they're going to stay and they're going to keep those pests at bay. Um, this integrated approach allows us to reduce our spray applications. So are we getting rid of them completely? Um, probably not, but um, your spray applications can drop dramatically. It may only be a spot spray. Uh, you may be able to spray with something that is a, uh, a softer chemical, like an oil or a, um, uh, a horticultural soap. So you don't have to come through and, and nuke it. Um, you can just come in, do a spot spray, uh, and get that population down to where the beneficials will be able to easier uh, manage it. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the bad guys. And this is not all inclusive. Uh, these are just some of the ones that we, we, we normally see. Uh, and I'm sure you guys have a lot of uh, experience with a lot of the uh, different um, pests, uh, depending on the crop that you're growing. But I'm just going to touch on, on, on some of the, uh, uh, I guess, the, the top five, top six bad guys. Thrips, Franklinelia. Uh, this is Western flower thrips. Uh, the one thing I want to point out is in all these cases, remember where I measured temperature dependency? Um, so this is, this is just uh, some data from a, a, a trial that shows that how the inverse occurs with generation time. So as the temperature is cooler, uh, this is grown on a bean plant for thrips. At 59 degrees, the generation time is 19 days. But as temperature goes up, you can see it's down to 6.3. So you always have to keep in mind, you know, um, with our temperatures and the time of year, um, how these pests will react and temperature is the key. Uh, thrips, um, female can lay up to eight eggs a day. Um, the higher the density, so the more thrips you have, the more females. If you have more females, she's gonna lay more eggs. Uh, if there's more females, how does the male find a female? pheromones. So these pheromones come out um, from the female so the male can mate. So the insects are really uh, pretty adaptable at how they are able um, to, to help their life cycles and help their populations. 
whitefly, um, always an issue. We see them a lot in, in um, uh, house plants. We'll see them in bedding plants, uh, container plants. So again, if we look at uh, our, temp our temperatures, so at 59 degrees, it takes 53 days. Um, but in this trial at 77 degrees, it's 25 days. So you can imagine in our temperatures, um, you know, there, there is a, a line where it peaks, but uh, this, this turnaround, these generations can, can explode on us rather quickly if we're not keeping an eye on what's happening in our garden. Uh, the females can lay up to six to eight eggs per day. Um, it's an even population mix of, of male to females. And of those eggs that are laid, uh, there's going to be a 16% mortality. So they will not uh, make it to adulthood. Now, this L1, that means the first larval stage is mobile. And this is key in um, determining how you're going to control these whitefly. Um, whenever the stages are mobile, they're usually more susceptible, whether you're spraying uh, uh, an oil uh, or a, uh, a soap or the beneficials in that area will feed on those mobile stages before, uh, in this case, the white fly attaches and goes through the pupa stage. So understanding how these insects, uh, how their life cycles work and how can you break that life cycle in order to get them under control uh, is also key. Spider mites, um, especially in the heat of the summer. Uh, so you can see this image here, I'm hoping you can see that uh, you can see the um, the webbing occurring. Uh, if you are seeing webbing like that, you are not monitoring or scouting your plants uh, efficiently. Um, if you get to that stage, uh, that 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 plant is probably going to be in decline. You're going to have to come in and spray something just to get that uh, population under control. Uh, as you can see with the temperature, at 59 degrees, it takes 36 days for a generation. But at 82, it's down to eight. Um, so uh, that key right there is how these temperatures and how these populations can get out of control so quickly for you uh, in the heat of the summer. Um, females will lay up to 10 eggs a day. Um, they'll go on just about any crop. There is a very low threshold, especially for producers on the, uh, especially in the greenhouse side, um, because that speckling, that that damage that they can do to the foliage, um, aesthetically is not good, and it will cause problems. They won't be able to sell it. Um, their mortality, natural mortality, is a little bit higher than the white flies. It's up to thirty-seven percent. Um, Usually low humidity, high temperatures are ideal. Greenhouses will see this, especially in the winter um, when their temperatures are high and the low humidity is low. I've got diapause down there because a lot of these mites um, will go into what we call a diapause stage, which means they almost, they, they, almost they, they go into a hibernation. And it's not temperature dependent, but it's day length dependent. So as the days get shorter uh, with the amount of daylight, uh, they will go into this hibernation. So they may go into the soil. They may go into uh, certain parts of the, uh, the plant where they will just get into this, um, especially on woody plants, uh, they will go into this diapause uh, stage. Uh, and you think the, the mites are gone. Um, but then as day length increases uh, and then as temperatures warm up, these mites will become active again and you'll have that problem uh, the following season. Uh, next up, aphids. Um, probably we're, we're seeing or dealing with them on a regular basis this time of year. The interesting thing with aphids is they are all females. They don't need any males, uh, and the female does not lay eggs. Um, they basically burp out a, uh, a young female, uh, on average about six young ones uh, per day. Uh, so their redouble time can can definitely uh, occur quickly. Uh, and then you can see how the temperature affects them. Um, some of these aphids are crop specific or crop dependent. So um, they are only going to go for a specific food source. Um, they have a piercing sucking mouth part. So they, their mouth part is almost like, is, is considered like a straw. They poke into that tissue and you're usually going to find these on the tips or the, the growing points where that 
uh, youngest tissue is, and they're going to go ahead and, and, and feed and, and pull out the, uh, the fluids uh, along the stem. One of the really cool things about aphids is they will give off an alarm pheromone. Uh, and so what that means is if they feel that they are threatened, whether it's by a predator or say you're coming through and you're spraying and they think something is not quite right, um, they will uh, put out this pheromone. The rest of the aphids will uh, sense it. They will remove their uh, feeding or, or that piercing sucking mouth part and they will just fall off of the plant and into the soil and burrow into the soil. Um, basically, they're playing possum that they, they, you think they're dead. So you can come through whether the uh, beneficial has come through or you've done a, a, a slight spray. Uh, you think they are all gone. You don't see them on the plant. Um, and then you come back two, three days later and they're back on that plant. And basically, this is what happened. That survival reaction kicked in. They dropped from the plant. They hid away from the uh, threat. And then they came back uh, to repopulate uh, the food source. And then I, I also mealybugs, because we're always dealing with this, whether it is uh, on a hibiscus, this is a gazania. But you can see these white, um, fuzzy, waxy uh, type insects that attach. Uh, again, they've, they've got that piercing, sucking mouth part. Um, they will cluster, they will put this white waxy powder over top of them, so that's why it gets difficult uh, to get them under control. Um, they will also, uh, sooty mold is, is, is usually a byproduct, so you can see them. Uh, there is, they have what, the, what we call these crawler stages where they are susceptible, so that's uh, an opportunity where some of these beneficials on that crawler stage uh, because it is more susceptible. So these are some of the um, major players uh, that we deal with with regard to the bad guys. So uh, let's start on the good guys. But first, I will ask, are there any questions, guys, for me that I can uh, answer now? Or are we good to keep moving? We're doing good. OK. Ashley asks, what's the best way to get rid of spider mites? Uh, well, we are going to get into that right now. We're going to talk about some of the good guys that will feed on them. Uh, and so um, let's uh, continue on and see if that answers, uh, if we get to her uh, answer there. So let's talk about some of the good guys. Who are some of these predators um, that, that are out there um, that can help pests under control? So first up is the green lacewing. Um, and so what we're looking at here is on our right side, this is the adult, okay? Uh, you're probably not going to see this too often. Maybe at night, uh, if you've got a light on, or I, I've noticed sometimes I'll, I'll see them on the, uh, the kitchen door. If we have the light on on the inside, they'll be attached to it. But they're very slender, light green body. They have these golden eyes and, a, and then these finely netted uh, wings. And the female will lay these rather unique eggs uh, that are on these filaments. So it almost looks like a, a, a pinhead. Uh, and the egg is on top of there. So it's, it's a, a way to ensure to keep it away from predators. Uh, and it sits above. So if you're out and you're monitoring your, your, your landscape and you're looking at your plants and you see some of these, they can be in clusters or they can be, you know, I've seen them singly uh, laying on, on the uh, leaf surface or on the, on the underside. This is a good sign. Uh, this is going to let you know that you've got uh, green lacewing in the area uh, and you're going to have some uh, larvae. And this guy, the larval stage, is the predator. Uh, so he, he looks pretty mean here. He's, he's got these very cool, he's got these two pincers. Uh, they love aphids. So what they will do is they will grab uh, the aphids by with these two pincers and then they will take their lower jaw stick it into uh, the aphid and basically suck the living life out of it um, so you know you've got these little sci-fi movies going on out in your garden and you probably didn't even know it uh, and these green lace wings are probably one of the one of the uh, uh, best predators out there uh, they are generalists so they will feed on uh, mites uh, and aphids and any other soft-bodied insects that are in the area. 
Um, the one unique thing is if your prey population or your pest population is low, uh, and if you've got a lot of this stage, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the immature or the larval stage, um, they can become cannibalistic and they'll feed on each other. You know, it's a bug eat bug world out there, uh, and it's all about survival. So in certain cases, these guys can become uh, cannibalistic. Uh, everyone knows the lady beetles, okay? So let's look at the life cycle here. This is uh, eggs are laid by the female, usually in clusters. They've got this honey-colored look. These eggs then hatch. We have that larval stage. Uh, the larval stage then becomes the pupa, and then we have the adult. Now, the good thing about ladybugs is both this larval stage and the adult stage are predators, um, predominantly soft-bodied insects. Um, so this larval stage is, it, what it needs to do is it needs to get large enough and feed enough in order to get through that pupa stage to eventually become an adult. So during this stage, um, that larval stage will feed on a, approximately 400 aphids uh, in order to um, get to the next stage. And then as it comes out as an adult, uh, the adults will feed on about 50 uh, aphids a day. They may damage them, they may bite the legs off, they may chew into them, um, they may not finish all of them, but they will damage them enough that they will kill off, uh, they, they will die off. So the ladybugs are excellent, excellent um, beneficial insects, and, and I'm pretty sure pr most people do know that, um, but understanding, you know, being able to identify what stage you have and knowing that not only the adults, but this larval stage, um, there are very good predators with uh, voracious appetites. Uh, next up is the, the hoverflies or surfeit flies. So we see the adult here, and the adult has that appearance that it almost looks like a bee. It's got the, bl uh, the uh, black and yellow striping on it, but it only has a single um, set of wings, uh, where bees have a double set of wings. And when this flies, it looks like a fly. Um, so the adult, is not the predator. That's why you can see it here eating on, you know, feeding on the pollen. This is why we want that diversity um, in order to keep the adults in the area so she can lay her eggs uh, and the eggs can turn into this larval stage, which is the predator. Um, they will feed on um, just about anything, mostly soft bodied uh, and immature uh, age uh, insects. Um, it's a generalist, so anything that's soft-bodied, uh, it will feed on. The female does a very good job, and when she lays those eggs, they're always going to lay them in a colony or in an area where there is a food source, um, because the mother knows uh, in order for those eggs to be successful and grow and be able to pupate, which we see here in the middle picture, in order to get through that life cycle, she's got to get them in an area where there is a ample amount of food. Uh, so she is always going to lay them, usually in an area where uh, aphids or some other soft-bodied insects where there's a population that is available. Uh, the long-legged flies, I really like these guys. Um, we had a um, earth kind roast trial down in the medical center uh, near MD Anderson. Uh, and in earth kind, we have minimal inputs. Um, we don't spray. Um, we never had any aphids. We never had any pests. Um, but we could, I could find these on just about any, every other plant. Um, they were flying around. They were doing their job. So the long-legged flies uh, are generalists. They'll feed on thrips. They'll feed on aphids. They'll feed on mites. Um, they'll feed on the uh, larvae of small insects. Um, and then the other thing, so the adults, but also their larval stage uh, is sort of like a scavenger. So they're going to feed on small insects. They may even feed on some of the pest eggs. So they're really good, um, beneficial. They're, they're, they're small, they're tiny, but you will, the, the metallic um, color will be easy to um, identify uh, when you see them on the leaf. I'm showing a, a, a green and, and like a, uh, an amber color here. I've seen them silver. I've seen them blue. I've seen them more golden. So these are ones that are definitely in the area. Um, a lot of them will have this black marking on their, leg, uh, on their legs, on their wings also. 
Um, so these are really good generalist predators that will feed on multiple types of insects and at multiple stages. So, um, and they, they are definitely prevalent uh, in our area. Um, the milkweed assassin bug is another one. This, this guy likes to do things on his own. You know, he's out there just stalking sort of, you know, you remember Wild Kingdom and they'd see the cats uh, stalking their prey. Well, that's what this guy's doing. He's out there by himself. Uh, he's got those nice long legs sort of just moving along. Uh, and he's another generalist. Uh, he is going to feed on aphids, caterpillars, beetles, flies, you name it. He may even feed on other beneficials. You know, if, if he's hungry enough, he's going to feed on other beneficials. So this is one where um, if it's in the area, he's going to feed on it and, if he, and he's hungry. So here's the uh, adult and then here's the nymph. And the nymph is also uh, a good predator. Now, some people, sometimes they will get this confused um, and they think they've got the nymphs of the um, leaf-footed bug, um, especially on their tomatoes. Um, but the, the nymph of that leaf-footed bug, um, they're going to be like in a herd. You're not going to see just one of these, you know, th those guys aren't out, out, out on their own one by one. Um, there's usually going to be a herd of them uh, on that leaf or, or on that tomato. These guys are always solitary, always out hunting on their own, feeding on their own. Uh, and they do a, 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 an, an excellent job. So if you ever see one of these by itself on your plant, by all means, you've got a, a milkweed assassin bug, you've got a beneficial, leave him be because he's going to keep things uh, in check out there. Now, this is Aphidiolides, um, and this is a gold midge. So this guy is specifically um, is going to control aphids. Uh, and this is another interesting one. So this is another one where the, here's the gold midge. So this is probably about the size of a, a fungus gnat or like a fruit fly. And the female is going to lay her eggs. You can see down here in the second picture, uh, these eggs are sort of an orangey color. And she lays them amongst the colony of aphids. And that's that larval stage. Again, it's usually the stage that needs to get to the next stage uh, before it pupates. It's got to grow. It's got to get large. And so what happens is, is it's very unique in how this feeds is it will bite into the joints of the legs. It will insert a toxin. And then it basically uses that leg like a straw to remove or suck out the fluids within that. And, and if all goes well, we're going to have a video. You're going to get to see how this works. Um, so um, these are, are very voracious. And it doesn't matter on which species of aphid. If it's an aphid, it's going to feed on it. Um, so these aphidiolides do are very efficient at feeding uh, on aphids that may be in your crop. On the other side, uh, this is another one that is strictly for aphids, um, but we've got the small parasitic wasp, and the genus is aphidius, and there, there's several species. But what happens is, as you can see in this image down here below, the female will come up on a colony, and she will use her antennae, and the antennae will set, sense to make sure it is the right species of avid. They, they're, they're specific. Um, certain, certain aphidias will only parasitize uh, the smaller types of species. Um, and uh, there's other species of aphidias that will only parasitize the larger types of aphids. So um, it, will, it will turn around and and uh, check on the species, those antennae, and then she will go ahead and usually sting it once, and then she will deposit an egg. Uh, so this egg is inside this aphid. Now the aphid will continue to feed for about another two to three days because of that piercing sucking mouth part, but it doesn't know what really happened to it. Um, so this egg starts to develop, it starts to grow into a larvae. It starts to feed on it. And then you start to see what we call these mummies. You'll see these grayish bumps. And it looks like a, a, an aphid that has definitely been at the uh, buffet table for too long. So it gets huge. But what happens is, is this is, if you see this, this is a sign that you've got parasitic wasps that are killing off your aphids. Because at the end, the adult uh, aphidius will then chew out the back 
uh, of this mummy and emerge and you've got another adult to keep the population going. So um, these parasitic wasps work e extremely well. They're nothing like, like I said, they're, they're not the, when I say wasp, sometimes people think that, you know, the size of the wasp that we would normally see, these are so tiny, you wouldn't even know them. And, you know, they have no interest in us. They're just looking for aphids in order to, for the female to lay her eggs. Um, there are predatory mites out there. Um, the most common genus is, is Amblyseus. Uh, a lot of times these are used in augmented systems. Uh, when I say that is you can purchase these predatory mites, um, release them. Greenhouse growers, nursery growers will use this, but now they're, they are, you can even purchase them for homeowners. Um, and you can release them into your garden or into your crop and they will feed on, they, these guys are more specific. So the image on the uh, left here, this reddish guy, um, that is uh, persimilis. It's actually Phytocelis persimilis, and it will only feed on two-spotted spider mites. And this guy is a junkyard dog when it comes to two-spotted two spider mites. Uh, it will feed voraciously. It will go after them, and but that's all it will feed on. Uh, and this one will not feed on pollen. So uh, if there are no more two-spotted spider mites, it's either going to leave and look for more, or it's going to just die off. Uh, some of the other ones, this is Cucumeris, which will feed on thrips. It will it feed on uh, the larval stages of white fly. Um, so some of these um, you can purchase, and other ones occur naturally um, that will feed on uh, either other mites or other pests. The minute pirate bug, uh, this guy is really pretty slick also. He's a generalist also. So he's going to feed on thrips. He's going to feed on mites. He's going to feed on white fly. He's going to feed on insect eggs. So we can see the adult down here. Very unique markings, uh, black with some white markings on it on its wings. Um, so the adult is a predator. And then the nymph is a predator also. And these guys have that piercing, sucking mouth part. So think of a juice box or a juice pouch, Capri Sun. You take that straw, you poke it in, and, you know, if you ever watch a kid drink it, uh, it will suck the, uh, as it's drinking, that, that bag just sort of closes on itself, and that's what happens the way these guys feed. Uh, they will feed on, on multiple um, species, um, but they are generalists. So anything that they can nail down um, and feed with that uh, piercing, sucking mouth part, um, they are going to go after. Uh, one more parasitic wasp we have here is Incarcia. This is strictly for white fly. So uh, the adult female in this one, she's not laying her egg into uh, a, a live uh, insect. She actually lays her eggs underneath the attached stage of the white fly. Remember I said there's a crawler stage for white flies and then they attach and go and they pupate. So how do we know we forgot paras uh, it's parasitized? It turns black. But the same thing happens. So she will come in, lay her egg underneath between the leaf surface and where that uh, larvae is attached. The egg will develop. It will feed on the inside. And then we can see uh, an adult will emerge uh, outside, uh, and emerge from that uh, basically cocoon and keep the population moving forward. Okay, so now um, let me go ahead and uh, I'm going to switch screens here because what I would like to do is actually show you how these beneficials are going to feed. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to pick another screen uh, and we'll see a, uh, a short video and I'll give you some uh, overview on what's happening there. So let me just... Hang in here for a second. Hang on to your hat, folks. It gets pretty cool. Okay. So I hope you have your popcorn, and I hope this doesn't turn off your uh, uh, your lunch plans. Uh, BioBest is one of the companies that produces beneficial insects, uh, especially for the greenhouse and nursery industry. So what we are going to see here, here we go. So here is the adult um ladybug feeding. Here is the larva stage of the green lacewing. See how it holds it in those mandibles and then is feeding below, drops off the next one and is just feeding away. You can make your own sound effects if you want. 
Um, here is that hoverfly. This guy looks like Jabba the Hutt. Uh, and he is just feeding on the soft-bodied insects. You can see how the mother laid, you know, she laid those eggs in that colony and is feeding. All right, we've got another one here of the uh, uh, lady uh, beetle feeding. Now, this is a phidias. So she, the female's going to make sure it's the right species with the antenna, and then she's going to pop it right there. She just deposited an egg. That, that aphid doesn't know what's happening. Here we go. Here's our mummy. Look at the size, how that has built up. And basically, because it's feeding, and then we've got aliens occurring. So this guy's emerging. Some Paul, of the, yes. Excuse me. Um, you might try turning off your video. The, the video we're watching is jumping a lot. Okay. So I don't know if that would help a little bit. Okay, hold on. Let me try that. We don't want to miss the gory details of this. Okay, so, uh, I hear you, man. I hear you. Okay, my camera is off. Uh, you're still seeing a, a thrip there, correct? Correct. Okay, now let me hit play. So here, here's uh, what adult thrips look like. And they remember, they got that rasping mouth part. We've got white flies here. So here's the adults. Uh, this is greenhouse whitefly, Bamesia. This is that first stage that's a crawler. See how it's moving? And then as they mature, they actually become, they attach and they pupate. And here's an adult um, whitefly emerging uh, after it pupates. All right, so here's our and a piercing sucking mouth part. They've got these cornicles. Um, they do, at certain points, they will grow wings. Uh, if the population is too heavy in an area, they will, they will start to produce wings to fly off and, and find another plant. But they love that soft tissue, all right? So here's, here's one of the predatory mites that's fe feeding on thrips. This is Cucumeris, uh, and they just grab it, and they just start to chew on it and remove the fluid. You can see he, he's, he's basically a shell of himself. Uh, there's not much left there. Uh, here's Swirskii, one of the other predatory mites, feeding away. Sometimes they work in teams. It depends on the uh, pest population that's in the area. Uh, but everybody's got to eat. So uh, you can see how they are just uh, feeding away. Uh, and then once they are done, they're, they're going to go off looking for other prey. That's why when uh, these plants, you know, you've got these plants in place, um, especially in the greenhouse, it, it works well when the, what we call the bridges. Now, here's the aureus. Now, look at the long mouth part. He pins that aphid, uh, I'm sorry, that thrips down and see how he's removing the life. Um, that yellow fluid is just gone, and that's that's one heck of a weight loss plan. There's not much there. Here's the nymph, all right? So the nymph is also a good predator. Now here, this is how, uh, for the white fly, where the female is, she's laying that egg underneath the, lar uh, the pupa of the white fly, between the surface of the tissue, of the leaf tissue, and then the actual uh, attached. It develops, and then again, it emerges the same way. It eats out um, that little cocoon, and we have a new good guy, adult. Um, it's a female. She is ready to start laying eggs uh, and doing the same thing. Uh, the photography on this is really pretty incredible, um, this company did. All right, so here's again, uh, this is on a Bemisia, so this would be white fly crawler. Uh, and you can see how this aphid, I mean, I'm sorry, this predatory mite is feeding on it. But they are very efficient. Um, they know how to find. Uh, you can see some of the trichomes on the leaf. And, um, you know, certain mites may not like a hairy hairy leaf like that. Uh, so the certain predatory mites may not go on that type of foliage because 
um, you know, there's just something about it. Uh, certain ones are, are specific for, uh, you know, they prefer this, the smoother foliage. All right, here's Aphidiolides. So see how it attacked the joint of the leg. It inserts the toxin. And now, if you can see that, um, it is using it basically like a straw. And the fluid is going into that larval stage. The, you know, that larval stage is feeding in order for it to get to that next to pupate. All right, here's the Phidias again. So watch the antenna. Bang, and then she hit it with an egg. Goes on to the next one. There we go. Missed the first time. There she goes. But those antenna are always working to make sure it's the right species. And a lot of times the aphids are, are just too busy feeding um, that they uh, don't even pay attention to it. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that part. I've just got a few more slides here. Let me stop sharing and then go back to my original deck. And we will finish up here. Okay. All right. I'm only going to briefly touch on uh, some of the attractors. You know, what type of plants um, do you want? Uh, should you be considering uh, in your landscape? Uh, and, and really, there's... Um, you know, the, the choices are endless, uh, but I'm going to just give you a couple of, uh, you know, my favorites that I like, especially for this time of year. Pentas, great pollen source, great nectar source, uh, very good color range. Um, sizes can be anywhere from 12 to 18 inches on up to 20 inches. So we can ha use, use them in the, in the front of the bed, in the back of the bed. They love the heat. The other thing is the value added is they bring in butterflies and hummingbirds. So some, so some more interest uh, into the garden. Marigolds are great, great pollen source. Um, sizes and colors, you know, you're always going to have, uh, you've got the French marigolds, you've got the African marigolds. So you've got various sizes. Um, they love the full sun. So again, another very good source of pollen for these beneficials. Zinnias, you can start to see the trend in the type of flowers and how easy it is for them to uh, get to that food source. Um, very good color range. We've got dwarfs. We've got uh, cut flower types. They love the full sun. Um, so uh, zinnias are also another good one to put in. And then I dropped in a Texas superstar, Henry Dolberg. Um, Love this plant. This is going to be a larger plant. I've got it down at three by three, but I've seen it even larger than that. But you can shear it. Uh, the bees, the bumblebees, uh, you know, uh, anything um, that's looking for our, some either pollen or some nectar, uh, the salvia is a good choice. Um, so any, if you go to either the Texas Superstar site, if you go to the Earthkind um, site on Aggie Horticulture, there's a plant selector in there. Any of those plants that are listed uh, in that group are going to be great plants um, that you should try and incorporate into your landscape uh, in order to, uh, you know, keep those beneficials in the area and to keep them happy. Um, resources, uh, these top five, BioBest, Copert, BioLine, these all uh, produce and sell beneficial insects. Uh, and they are starting to, you know, produce quantities that um, home gardeners can now purchase. Um, if you want two excellent resources, uh, first one, Bug Lady Consulting. Um, Suzanne Wainwright Evans, uh, she is a consultant, and this is all she does is works with growers, works with landscapers, works um, in, in how to incorporate beneficial insects as part of your IPM program. She's got a section there for homeowners, um, 
really good articles and, and she writes a lot so she's she's got some really good pictures and, and things like that and then our own the galveston county master gardener site has a really good uh, link on beneficial insects um they they did an excellent job on pulling that together so um that's another one um that you may want to uh consider um in order to help you to identify some of these things uh and it's just a good resource to know where you can go uh, to get that information uh, so with that, um, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, gang, if there's any questions, uh, I guess I am ready to answer. Uh, and uh, we can go from there. So any questions? Paul, I think uh, the Wranglers have been answering as we go, but uh, Good. we'll invite people to type new questions in. We can pass them along. Okay. There was a question about, are there any native plants you can think of that you might recommend to attract beneficial insects, kind of a pollen nectar thing? Yeah, it, it, well, I guess off the top of my head, some of the Asclepias will help. Um, you know, the uh, Gallardias, there's the Coreopsis. Um, you know, really anything that, that has a a pollen source or or has that um, uh, uh, potentially produces the nectar, uh, it's going to be better than nothing. Uh, so whether you want to go with, you know, uh, natives, when you, whether you want to go with, you know, bedding plants, depending on the time of year, um, it, the main thing is make sure you're, you're, you're bringing that diversity into the landscape to keep them there and keep them, uh, you know, in play so they can uh, keep that pest population in check. Paul, you have a question about uh, controlling sod webworms. Are there beneficials recommended for that? Uh, at this point, not that I am aware of. Um, you know, you would think um, and I didn't even touch on these, that um, in the greenhouse industry uh, and in the nursery industry, we can use beneficial nematodes, um, which can go and they will attack um, various larval stages. Um, but I, don't, I have not come across any research that they have used these beneficial nematodes to treat that larval stage of the sod webworm. So, um, I am not aware of any. Now, you know, some of these generalists, if they happen to be in the tar in the uh, lawn area, they will feed on them. But, um, you know, predominantly they're going to be where the flowers are uh, just because they want that uh, possible uh, pollen source to feed on. Uh, and they're normally, you're not going to see them um, really uh, inhabiting uh, the turf grass area. Uh, Paul, mealybugs have come up a number of times in the questions. Uh, do you have any particular favorite beneficials or techniques for managing mealybugs? Well, um, you know, lady beetles will feed on them. There is a species um, that it, it's called, I, actually, uh, the common name is, is uh, they call it the mealybug destroyer. Uh, the genus is Cryptolemus. Um, people have uh, release that uh, onto plants. Um, I have not seen it occur. I'm sure it does occur naturally, um, but a lot of times people will augment that system by buying them if they have a heavy uh, population and that cryptolemus, they will release it. Uh, and it almost looks like a, a type of mealybug, but it's, it, it's, it's um, in the larval stage. Um, but it, it, it has a different uh, habit to it. Uh, so cryptolemus is, is probably the one that's used mostly. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the lady beetles, um, if before they get to that waxy stage, uh, they will feed on uh, the crawlers and some of those immatures. Uh, so it's one where you might have to do a, a light spray to knock back the adults uh, in order to allow the beneficials to come in and feed on the uh, younger stages. 
Paul, you have a question about controlling aphids on milkweeds when you already have beneficial insects present. Um, well, if good question, uh, I would say so. The the problem is, is it the po population is too big and the beneficials can't handle it. Um, in that case, um, you may want to you might have to come in with a, a, a light spray. And I know there that's the you know, you got you got to balance that uh, a lot of times with the um, milkweed people will just allow those aphids to be there because of the food source or the you know the habitat it it supplies. I go through and squish them every once in a while. There you go. You can always do that. Another thing to remember is all those beneficials on that milkweed are being raised into adults to fly around and help you. So you could look at that as a nursery rather than a problem. Exactly. Right. It, it's, it's, you know, we, when we talked about those thresholds, um, you know, are the aphids that are on that plant, uh, are they affecting the growth of the plant? Are they, is there, is it a negative effect? Uh, if the answer is no, but you've got beneficials there and they're feeding on them and, and that population doesn't get out of whack too much, but they're always there, then you, li you live with it um, because the beneficials are probably doing what, they're, what they need to do. Um, they're keeping it in check. There's some food source there for them, um, but it's not having a negative effect on the plant. So you, you've always got to look at the big picture and, and, and see where that threshold is. I had a question on stink bugs on tomatoes. Okay. I'm going to expand that, Paul. We had another question on leaf-footed bugs and cucumber beetles. So if you want to just comment on all three of those. Yeah. So um, really, um, there's not a specific predator for them. So the milkweed assassin bug, if, if that's out there, it will feed on, on them. Um, at some of the younger stages, um, if you've got a uh, lady beetle larva, they'll, they'll feed on the younger stages. Um, so really there's not one specific item uh, beneficial that's out there. And this was always a, a challenge when I did technical support in the greenhouse side because um, growers either wanted to release one beneficial in their greenhouse that would cover everything. And then they wanted to say, kind of my chemical, it's it, when you work a system like uh, a lot of it is, is, is some of these other, and I'm sure there, there may be other beneficials out there that would go specifically towards that. I'm just, at this point, um, you know, I'm not aware of it, um, but I know some of these other ones as generalists um, should be able to um, keep them in check. Uh, Paul, this is Boone. Sure. Uh, we had a this is a, a stump to chump question here, but okay. uh, the question was on uh, um, sharpshooters, etc. You know, if they're acting as maybe disease vectors, mm -hmm. um, any any beneficial strategies uh, for this group of insects? Um, probably not that I'm aware of for the adults. Um, now that you know, some of the ones that I mentioned may feed on the egg stages or the immature stages. Um, again, it, it's not one that I think there is a site. Uh, UC Davis, I believe, has a site um, with beneficials. And I know, you know, especially glassy wing sharpshooters were a big issue out there, especially for the nursery industry at one time. Uh, and they probably still are. Um, their site may have um, a list of, of specifics um, with regard to getting those guys under control. Paul, earlier we posted the list of links you had for various suppliers. Um, adding that again to the list for people to see. Uh, there was a question about purchasing those, and I'm assuming most folks listening are not commercial. Would you recommend any of those links as being better for maybe a home gardener as opposed to a commercial greenhouse? Or um, Okay, so I think I had uh, Arbico and Beneficial Insectary would probably suit you better. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe, I think it's Copert now has a home garden site. Um, where you can buy um, 
you know, smaller quantities. Um, you know, the, the issue is always going to be, and, and even for, for growers, um, the product itself isn't, you know, in certain cases um, that expensive, um, but it's the shipping that gets you um, because it has to be overnighted. So there may be a situation that, um, you know, if you want to do a release, if you want to do an augmented situation, you know, you're going to be paying more for the shipping than you are for the actual um, beneficial. Um, I would recommend not purchasing um, uh, ladybugs because they are wild harvested and they're usually harvested up in the Sierra Mountains and they're usually out of sync with our situation. Um, and the rule of thumb, whenever you're releasing flyers, you know, if, if you say you, 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 you purchased Aphidius or whatever, um, you, you release them at low light levels. And so what does that mean? It, it means dawn or dusk. When your light levels are low, they're not going to fly out to the light. They're not going to, uh, we see this in the greenhouse, especially with, with um, you know, HID lights, artificial lighting, but especially in high light levels. So the best thing to do is you just open the container um, either early, early morning before the sun's up or in the evening just as the sun is going down and really just open that container, place it on its side. Um, don't put it upright because if it rains, um, it's going to catch water and, and they're going to uh, uh, drown out, but just lay it on its side somewhere in the shade deep in the, you know, in that landscape or underneath the bush and then just let them naturally come out and then they will establish in the plant or in the landscape or in the crop. So, um, that's a key because everybody says, well, I, I bought ladybugs. I opened it up and they all flew away. Well, you know, what I asked, what time of day did you do it? And they said, well, I went out about two o'clock in the afternoon. And I said, well, that's, that's going to be a problem. Um, so, you know, these are some of the tricks that, you know, hide it, place it on its side. You know, you don't have to shake them. Just let them, you know, naturally make their way out. They'll find the, the plants and then they'll start um, uh, to become the predators that they're, they're meant to be. Anything else? All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, as you can see up, uh, just want to remind you, uh, next week, Stephen Yannick will be talking on understanding soils on the Texas Gulf Coast. Uh, and the 26th will be Ginger for a Tropical Flare, uh, and that will be Stephen Brugerhoff from Bra Brazoria County. So I want to thank you all for joining us. I hope you have a, a great day and a uh, Great rest of the week. Um, thank you. We also want to remind you that uh, getting an email later with a survey and also a link to be able to watch this video. If you want to go back and, and hear some of the things Paul was talking about and all the other videos that we've done in this series over the Wednesdays are available on the YouTube site that, that will be in that, in that email from Paul.